Welcome to Banfield. Rule number one in Fight Club, don't mess with a New York judge. And if Prince Andrew, the Royal Duke of York, has any fight in him, he'd better rethink his strategy in a case filed against him by a Jeffrey Epstein victim. Prince Andrew was due in court today the allegation that he raped Virginia Robert Scouffray when she was just 17 because Jeffrey Epstein loaned her out. Andrew dispatched his lawyer instead, who right out of the gate suggested there's no case here because of how the prince was served, challenging the legality of serving papers to his royal highness. The lawyer also questioned where the case was being heard because Andrew is a British subject. We believe that this is a baseless, non-viable, and potentially unlawful suit, the lawyer says. If any of this sounds like rubbish, well, just wait until you hear how the Queen plays into all of it. They, the royals, may not be amused, but apparently they are immune, apparently from a lot. Joining us now, attorney Jim Murray, who's the chief correspondent for Inside Edition, and royal watcher Hillary Fordwich. So I'm, I'm going to start with you, Jim Murray. I thought you had to be at court. I didn't think you could just send your lawyer, but maybe when it's this early in the proceedings, this is okay. It just doesn't sound okay to say we don't belong here. Well, I think from a legal standpoint, I think they're saying, look, they, they, they did not serve Prince Andrew properly. There was no proper service. There's no jurisdiction to hear this. Before you can really get to the case on its merits, first you have to have jurisdiction and you have to bring the parties in. Prince Andrew had his LA based law firm appear in the New York court saying there was no service here. And when there's no service, you can have the best case in the world. You're not moving forward. The judge basically said, look, you, you guys are wasting money. It's clear that Andrew knows about this case, but I'll take this up on, on your particular argument that he was not properly served. He scheduled another date for October. But basically, it comes down to we're not going to get to the merits of this case until the judge first decides whether Andrew was properly served. Okay, so Hillary Fordwich, help me out here, because as we look at the affidavits in this case, it sounds like there was a process server. That's a fancy name for the guy who says, you've been served, you know, and hits somebody with the papers in, in Hollywood, uh, you know, depictions. But it was someone by the name of Cesar Augusto um, Sepulved. And th there's actually some, you know, some affidavit material that says he did his job. It says uh, he served the papers on a fifth attempt, leaving the summons with police at the gate at Royal Lodge in, in Windsor. And that's where Andrew lives. But, I mean, Hillary, you can't get within 50 feet of the President of the United States or, you know, Prince Andrew, the Duke of York. So you can't hit the papers on his bare midriff or his chest or his arm. You, you would have to give it to the, the guards at the gate. Is that not acceptable? Well, I'm not a lawyer, but what actually happened, at least I can clarify what actually happened, it was the second attempt. They were turned away the first day and the second day when they returned back in August, August 27th, they did return. The Metropolitan police accepted it. They accepted that summons. Um, Prince Andrew was up at Balmoral. He had gone up there um, to be with the Queen. And actually, if you think about it, um, the, in Scotland, they have what is called the right to roam, which is you're allowed to roam on Scottish property. Um, although Balmoral is a private property, um, it is actually, if you think about it, rather selfish of Prince Andrew to be up there because there can be photographers up there, up in Balmoral. We know that photographers have been trying to take photographs of him while he's up there and that's actually encroaching on the queen's you know private time while she's there so that's actually rather selfish of him and we know that he's tried to evade being photographed we know that he's tried to evade being served and what he's trying to do and obviously his lawyers are trying to do is they're trying to stall the process at every single turn they're trying to avoid being served and they're trying to stall every single um attempt that's been made to serve him in person and the legal process in general. Well, then it's a good thing Stacey Honowitz is around. She's an assistant state attorney uh, of the Sex Crimes and Child Abuse Unit in Florida. And Stacey, you're the perfect person to answer this. I know you're not a Brit, and I know you don't probably hang out at Castle Gates much, but it would seem to me that you can't 
you can't not um, be a part of the system just because you've got security guards. Help me understand the whole service process when it comes to a guy who's protected by palace gates. Well, I don't know, in all honesty, what the um, process is over there with regard to uh, personal service. But we have heard that the personal service or the papers that were given to the security guard, the security guard evidently told the process server, I'm forwarding them to his legal department. So somebody over there has paperwork. Somebody knew about this hearing today. Somebody is fully aware that he has to appear in court. And what is going to happen is service will eventually be gotten. That, that's going to happen. People do this all the time, whether you're in the United States or whether you're international. They try to avoid being personally served. But here, with regard to getting close to him, there has to be some kind of process because other people have been sued as to where that paperwork is going to so that you know you have to be in court for something. You can't avoid it forever. Yeah, and I mean, Jim, you know, at one point, the judge in the case seemed to be getting pretty annoyed at the hoity-toity business saying, look, you're citing the Hague, you're citing all these special systems that have to be in place, and I'm going to use his words, you're making it more complicated than it needs to be. It sounds like right. he's doing a smackdown and saying, this is going to happen, so get ready. And Let's talk about when it does, Jim, because I, I find it fascinating that the lawyer in this case, Andrew Brettler, you know, he entered his notice of appearance, so it's on the record, okay, he's, he's there saying, I don't like this, I don't like the jurisdiction, I don't like the service, but we're here. And then he said something interesting, like, I want to get my hands, the lawyer for Andrew said, on a document in another right. case. He didn't mention the case, but we all kind of think it's the Ghislaine Maxwell case in which there was a and follow the bouncing ball, guys. There was a settlement between Virginia Roberts Gouffre, who's the you know, plaintiff in, in this case against Andrew and Jeffrey Epstein, in which there was some language that suggested, you know, she settled the case with that monster. And somewhere in there, it said everybody in his inner circle is OK now. They can't be sued. So, Jim. Does that mean that Prince Andrew needs to choose between being in Jeffrey Epstein's inner circle and avoiding this case or saying he was not in Jeffrey Epstein's inner circle and then having to really annoy his mom? Well, he really wants it both ways. He's still saying, I'm not served, so I shouldn't be in this case. But then he's saying there was this secret agreement. We need it unsealed so that it will show that Virginia uh, Jufri has basically accepted a settlement with respect not only to Epstein, but with respect to anybody associated with Epstein. And you're right, that is basically an admission that he's in Epstein's inner circle, but we already know that. We know there was a relationship. And with respect to why this is being held in New York, Virginia is claiming that one of the three times she claims that she was sexually abused was in New York. So that's why the case is brought there. But I, I think that I think that based upon Andrew's earlier interview, where it was a train wreck, uh, I think everyone's holding their breath to see if he's going to break with his legal team and try to talk again to the press. Yeah, you know, Hillary Ford, which I, it's this it's this Hobson's choice for for the prince, it seems. And tell me if I'm wrong here, but he either has to say, I was not in Jeffrey Epstein's inner circle, and, and that would make his mom, the queen, very happy. But, uh, oh, dear, he's he's now basically got to face this suit because he won't have that lovely immunity fr from that settlement. Or he's got to say, I was in Jeffrey Epstein's inner circle. And that's hideous PR, but he might actually be protected. What on earth would the prince do and how much uh, influence would the queen have in that decision, Hillary? Well, it's a lose-lose situation, and actually that's already passed because in his ghastly BBC interview, he already admitted that he was in the inner circle because remember when he was questioned by Emily as to why on earth he would go and stay in Jeffrey Epstein's townhouse in New York City, he said that he had to personally end their friendship after he'd been convicted as a pedophile right then. So he went to personally stay in New York to end a friendship. So he already admitted he was in the inner circle. So that is a done deal because he said it on air, on the BBC. Now to the second part of your question. Um, he has already 
basically, in the court of public opinion, he's already lost. This is terribly damaging to the royal family. And at the Queen, at her royal age of 95, this is the worst thing that could be done to her because for, she spent over 70 years trying, you know, building up the royal family and all that she's tried to accomplish. And he has now denigrated that um, by his association with Jeff Jeff Jeffrey Epstein after he'd been convicted. So he has done damage to the royal family. The best thing he could do, the best thing he could do, he's already stepped down from royal duties, is to go out of the limelight for good, forever. And he should have settled this, obviously, years ago, but that, of course, would be a, of being admitting some kind of culpability. He could have donated huge start sums to the charities that Virginia Gaffray, um supports um, that is for victims. And he should have, at least at that point, his, if his lawyers had responded to silent and quiet requests that had been made to him very privately, he could have made all this maybe have gone away, maybe go away. This could have gone away years ago. But he didn't. He failed to do that. And at this juncture, in the court of public opinion, they've already lost. So, um, okay, th this may not have any bearing on anything. However, it is just too um, bizarre to, to pass up. Um, Rudy Giuliani um, on Saturday spoke to an annual 9-11 dinner. Now, it was the 20th anniversary, so this is a pretty somber and profound event. And for whatever reason, he chose to start impersonating the Queen and made a comment about Andrew and having never gone out with the, the women and girls. That I mean, I'm just going to let him speak for himself. Here was Rudy Giuliani um, here in New York on Saturday. She said, you did, you did a wonderful job. On September 11, and therefore I'm making you an honorary knight, commander of the royal something or other. I turned down a knighthood because if you took a knighthood, you had to lose your citizenship. I know Prince Andrew is very uh, questionable now. I never went out with him. Ever. Never. Never had a drink with him. Never was with a woman or a young girl with him. Ever, ever, ever. One time... I met him in my office, and one time when we had the party, right, Bernie? You were there. I am sure that Bernard Carrick was none too pleased with being included in that lot, and I don't know what any of that had to do with the somber anniversary of 9-11. It was an appalling thing to no. do, and that is not biased. That's just me. I'm a New Yorker. Uh, I was a, a, a victim of 9-11, and knowing that America's mayor did that and said that, it, it's disgusting. Stacey Honowitz, disgusting is one thing. Does it have any bearing on anything? No, I mean, look, it, it, it is what it is. It's disgusting. I don't know what he was trying to do. But the fact of the matter is everything that you were talking about before, everybody knows about him being in an inner circle. That's why Giuliani was joking about it, you know, because everybody knows the relationship. You take that one picture that has been broadcast all over of him with his arm around her waist, and people think to themselves, something went on there. He knew Epstein. He was with Epstein. And it's... When we talk about avoiding service, that's what's happened here. He's opened a Pandora's box because so much has been talked about, so much has been in the press. When he did that interview, he tried to avoid it so much that he kind of stepped in it more. And that's what we're looking yeah. at. When you're fighting it and you're fighting it and you're fighting it, it's almost like I know that I'm part and parcel of all of this. I just don't want to have any responsibility. So the more you protest, the more the press, like we are doing, is talking about your involvement. And that's what's happening here. He will be served eventually. They can contest it all they want. You can always say, you don't have jurisdiction, you don't have service over me, but you can continually try to do that. And that's what the lawyers will be doing in this case. All right, uh, team, stay exactly where you are uh, because this is not a problem that's going to go away for the royal family. And believe it or not, it is not the only problem for the royal family either. After fleeing across the ocean, Harry and Meghan have requested an audience with the Queen. What do you suppose this is about? Back in a moment.
Back now with more on the Prince and all his problems. Uh, we've got Inside Edition's Jim Murray with us, attorney Stacey, Stacey Honowitz, and royal watcher Hillary Fordwich. Okay, I want to play for all three of you a comment that was made by Virginia Gouffre's dad. Uh, he did an interview with Good Morning Britain, um, and he was asked a question I think most journalists would ask a dad whose daughter is suing a prince for rape. Um, they asked him, what do you want to see happen? to the prince, and, and this is what, his name is Sky Roberts, this is what Sky Roberts said, take a look. Uh, I would like to see him, you know, go to prison for at least a little while, I mean, he needs to know what it's like, you know, to be held accountable for his actions, you know. Um, my daughter just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, I mean, Prince Andrew was friends with a, a known pedophile. I mean, he's been to, you know, his ranches, he's been to New York. There's pictures of Prince Andrew and Jeffrey Epstein everywhere. As far as documents with them together, I, I have no idea, you know, but he needs to be held accountable. Um, Hillary Fordwich, there are all sorts of rumors that Prince Andrew and Fergie might be getting back together and getting married, which is bizarre, uh, you know, even in the headline. But the legal legals among us all will say, oh, yeah, I know what that's about. That's so that you don't have to testify against your spouse. I don't know that that's the case in England, but it sure is the case in America. First and foremost, as a royal watcher, is it true? Are they actually thinking of getting back together and getting married? Well, it's, it's long been known. Actually, during COVID, they did um, spec get even closer, but they've lived together for many, many years at Royal Lodge. Um, they, of course, were married back in 1986. They separated in 1992. Now, the person that was blocking them ever remarrying, because it's been actually talked about for many, many years, was Prince Philip, who very sadly passed away, of course, this year, back in April. Um, he was very against it. He actually found the, the, the situation with, obviously, her so's be toes being sucked many years ago and that was on the front pages of all the tabloids that was despicable he found and he was the one that insisted that they divorced but um she actually was quoted as saying that she, although they were divorced that um, she took an oath and that prince andrew was always in her heart and um she has also said that they felt that they were ironically the happy most happily happily um divorced happily um um, a cohabitating couple and that they were happily living living together um, and they have lived in Royal Lodge raising their daughters for many years so yes it is true and as many insiders know um, they have talked of remarrying for many many years and during this whole COVID lockdown they stayed together and it would not be off the books at all well, okay, um, that would be fascinating, especially if, if she were called into any, any of this uh, to be a witness, because certainly she was around back then when this alle right. allegation um, is made. And so, she Jim Murray also oh, go um, ahead. took a loan from him. She uh, also took a loan well, from Jeffrey Epstein, of course. Fo follow the money. Um, so, Jim Murray, right. I thought when I heard that Harry and Meghan were requesting an audience with the Queen that it might have something to do with this, but I don't know. Maybe it's something a lot less, um, you know, serious. And maybe it's just that they want the queen to meet her great granddaughter, Lilibet. Is that, is that the well, Lilibet I, I think they call her? Lilibet, yes. I think that they want her mm -hmm. christened in the UK. And I don't know that that's going to happen. It's, it is interesting. I was just looking at some headlines and I did notice that the Oprah interview with Harry and Meghan just lost an Emmy to Stanley Tucci's Italian cooking show. I'm sure that didn't sit well with them. But uh, I think that I don't think it has anything to do with the Epstein case. I really don't. I think it's much more personal to them. And and to be honest with you, when I heard of Virginia Giuffre's dad, I, I'm a dad of two daughters. I, I would have felt the same way. But in this case, I don't think you're even looking at the potential of jail time. This is a civil lawsuit. We're talking about service of process, not arrest. We're not talking about extradition. We're talking about you know, there'll be a verdict against him for monetary damages. Um, so, I, But I think that you're right in the court of public opinion. Both Harry and Andrew are, are at the bottom of the heap with respect to how the Brits feel yeah. about them. And Stacey, again, I'm not going to make you put on, um, you know, a beef eater hat here. <laughs> Don't ask me why I know that. Um, but I, <laughs> I am curious about Scotland Yard. You know, they made some comments earlier that they are uh, taking a relook. I mean, they use this funky sort of, you know, innocuous language, but it does mean they're relooking at their files, and there's a lot there. So the, that whole hiding behind Mumsy's cloak 
actually could work for Andrew if he's in any of the royal residences. And and by the way, when I say any, there are a lot of them. You know, he could be at Buckingham Palace, Kensington, Kensington Palace, Windsor Castle, Balmoral, any of the other estates. Apparently, the laws over there say you can't arrest a member of the royal family. It just sounds lunacy, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, listen, they have special privileges. We know that. The fact of the matter is, I think everybody has to realize, like Jim said, this is a civil lawsuit. And although Scotland, Scotland Yard might be looking at and reopening, I don't think the likelihood of them being arrested is really going to happen. Um, you know, the rules are different. When you're a celebrity sometimes and when you're royalty, sometimes the rules are different. And over there, it seems to be that you can't get close, you can't arrest, you can't serve. But in this case, you know, there was somebody there that accepted paperwork and said, I'm, I'm forwarding it on to his legal team so they know about it. Just like when you have an authorized agent for a corporation here that ex can accept service, over there, the, we're try what they're trying to say here is that it was accepted. They signed something. They said they were going to send it. So whether or not service was accepted legally at this point doesn't really make a difference because at some point they will be able to figure out the proper way to serve if the judge doesn't think that's it as far as scotland yard reopening investigation i don't have a crystal ball but i don't think that anything's going to come of an arrest of prince andrew in this case yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this whole service mess uh, actually ends up playing out, whether they have to reserve or this original serve. Uh, well, well it seems so silly, doesn't it? But then again, it's the Royals. There's a lot of protocols. Hey, Stacey, Hillary, and Jim, uh, thank you so much. In fact, Jim, I'm going to ask you if you'll stick around for a minute because coming up, a one-time, one-man legal powerhouse suddenly has a major legal problem. Make that another legal problem. The Murdoch mystery and the missing millions when we come back. Welcome back. A man who looked as though he never had a bad day before this summer just had another wretched one. Alex Murdoch, a name once virtually synonymous with law and justice in the low country, learned today that South Carolina State Police are on the case of the alleged embezzlement that cost Murdoch his job at the family firm and with it, his power and likely his profession. A source close to the case told local media that the missing funds could total $5 million. Officially, the State Law Enforcement Division, better known as SLED, well, they're saying only that the public should be, quote, patient and let this investigation take its course, end quote. Uh, investigative decisions we make through this case, they say, and any potentially related case must ultimately withstand the scrutiny of the criminal justice process. Well, I get that, you get that, but if you have been following this saga at all, you know that the phrase, any potentially related case, that covers a lot of ground in this one. The biggest potentially related case, but not the first, would be the murders of Alex Murdoch's wife and younger son, Paul. That happened in early June. The most recent would be the non-fatal shooting of Alex Murdoch himself on the side of the road last week, September 4th. Before I bring in my experts, we also have a Buster Murdoch sighting to report tonight. And I know that's strange, but listen, we haven't seen him. The Daily Mail published these pictures of Alex Murdoch's elder son at the family beach house. This is last Friday, and it's the first time that Buster had actually been seen in public at all since his dad was wounded and then resigned and then went into rehab. The Daily Mail said it appeared as though he and another woman, possibly a family member, were moving things out of that house. But what and why and to where, he was not saying. Time to welcome back Jim Murray, along with... Andrew Davis, investigative correspondent for WSAV-TV in Savannah, and he is steeped in this case, lives it every day. So, Andrew, I'm going to begin with you on this one. Uh, should we make much of the fact that SLED, basically the law enforcement folks, have now jumped into this missing millions business instead of just the law firm that said, we're going to do a forensic accounting, and yeah, he's now resigned because, you know, we pushed him out. Does this mean a lot? 
It means something to me, definitely, Ashley. I think you have to look at it and say, well, how is this connected to the murder case? How is this connected to any other case? And you do have to follow the money, which I know you like to do. And in this case, you could follow the money directly back to perhaps some nefarious characters out there who could be involved in this, or if Alex himself had to do something with the money because of all the money that was coming to him from Randolph Murdoch, his, his father, who had had, who passed away three days after his wife and son were killed, there was a large quantity of money. They had already moved some of that money around from the properties and the names on those properties around to keep them out of the civil case related to Mallory Beach, who died in the boating crash previously that Paul Murdoch was going to stand trial for. So Maggie Murdoch's name were on multiple of those properties. She was in charge. In fact, that Edisto Beach property, everything that I keep hearing about was she may have been staying there, living there, using that more as her address, perhaps with some issues between the two of them. There's been rumor of divorce, a rumor of a lot of things out there. Of course, there are a lot of rumors in this case as well. But you have to look at the withstand the scrutiny of the criminal justice process. To me, that means they are closing in on something, whether it's a suspect or on Alex himself. And this is the next level of that to tie it all together to make sure they bring this to trial and get a conviction. So, well, with all of that, sir, and boy, do you ever need a flow chart for this story? I mean, if you're just coming in on it, I, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. <laughs> I mean, it would take two hours to bring you up to speed on everything that's happened. But Jim Murray, one of the things that did happen early that it really begs repeating, because it's weird and it's days away, is the weird date of September 30th was thrown out there by Alex and Buster Murdoch. This was after um, Paul and Maggie were shot. And the surviving two family members said, we will pay. We'll pay anything. We'll pay $100,000 for anybody who can give us a tip that will lead to the killer of our mother and uh, um, wife and uh, son and brother. And the weird thing was, but you got to tell us before September 30th, because there's a statute of limitations on this reward, which I'm sorry, I've just never heard of in my life. It's weird. Yeah. It's odd. It's coming up. But now, Jim, uh, boy, what a difference a month or two can make. Who's going to pay this $100,000 now? It was administered through Alex Murdoch's law firm, and he's out, and now he's got a lot of financial problems. So do we know anything about this reward money now? Well, you, 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 re, you raise an interesting question. It, the, the money was coming from the firm. He is now allegedly under investigation for embezzling money or stealing money from the firm. And and there were there were payouts in the past, there was a huge payout of $500,000 in a slip and fall death just a few years ago. And they're reopening, investigators are reopening a case of another person who was found on a country road dead in 2015. And the Murdoch name came up a great deal in that investigation. You know, when the mother and son were killed just a few months ago, everyone thought it was in relation to the to the trial that Paul Murdoch was going to be facing for this boating accident where a young girl was killed. But now, after the shooting of Alex, we, I, I mean, you're right, you need a flow chart for this. And, and also the Supreme Court in that state uh, took uh, his law license and suspended it. So it's not just that he's under investigation. His law license is suspended. He's no longer part of the firm. This guy is in a heap of trouble. And, and it may be criminal. It may be it, it, it's certainly civil, but probably criminal as well. Right. And, and I'm just going to ask one last quick question because it just came to mind. Uh, Andrew Davis, I remember early on, uh, Randy, Alex's brother, went on Good Morning America and said that there were these credible threats that had been coming into his nephew, Paul, right before he was shot dead. Then I never heard another word about that. Is that because there wasn't another word about that, or is there something to that that they're still investigating? There's been zero word about that at any point. I heard it again in a rumor fashion when I was at the scene last Saturday when Alec Murdoch was shot. Beyond that, no one is saying anything about that so far. And understand that reward situation is very confusing to everybody concerned. I've been on the board of directors of Crime Stoppers in Georgia for several years as well. And if you look at it, two thirds of the murder cases are solved within one month of time. After that, it goes mm. down significantly to 10%, even 5% if you make it all the way to a year. To put any sort of deadline on a murder investigation and a murder reward at that point is limited and crazy at some point for so many people. Because if you really want this to happen, then you want to leave that out as long as possible because only about 20% of people pick up those rewards to begin with. 
So you're trying to just draw somebody out, but why put an end to it? And there's questions right now in that law firm that you've talked about, actually, and I've got calls in there trying to find out exactly what they're going to say and if they're going to honor that reward, even if Alec isn't there anymore. Right, because it's not their guy anymore, but it is his brother, because Randall still works at that firm. So it's a very complicated situation, uh, to be sure. And the two of you are just excellent uh, doing your homework and your investigation and keeping up with all of this. I know it isn't easy. Jim Murray, thank you. Andrew Davis, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, we got a new approach uh, that we just heard about to ending gang violence in Chicago, and you are going to want to listen up. That city's mayor says, we're going to sue them. We're going to sue the gangs. I love it. But will it work? Think it through. Do they have bank accounts? Do they file a tax return? I'm going to ask a lawyer who has successfully defended four of these kinds of lawsuits already. And then I'm going to ask the big kahuna himself, the guy who used to run that state, does he think it's going to work and why is it such a problem in Chicago? Who says crime doesn't pay? Gangs and crime syndicates have been profiting nicely off of their illegal activities for decades. And now a lot of people, including lawmakers, say best way for crooks to feel the pinch is to hit them in their role of Benjamins. Should criminals have to pay money for their crimes? Money, not time. Money, maybe also time. City officials say, yeah, you bet. And when you look at the statistics, it seems like a great idea. There are more than 100,000 gang members in Chicago alone. That's about 4% of that city's population. And according to some estimates, those 100,000 people account for a whopping 70 to 80% of the city's total violent crime. That's why administration after administration in that city have tried everything to bring down the gangs and curb the violent crime with, sadly, little success. Chicago is still considered the most gang-infested city in the country, with more than 50 recognized and active gangs. Over Labor Day weekend, 65 people were shot in that city, killing six people. The victims included a 15-year-old girl, a 12-year-old boy, and a 4-year-old boy. Following the killings, Chicago's police superintendent, David Brown, said... It is always some other offender, gang member, criminal network, some beef, and they're targeting some adult, and young people are nearby, and they are shot as innocent bystanders. In a surprising move, Chicago's mayor, Lori Lightfoot, wants to bring down the hammer on gangs. But what kind of hammer is it really going to be? Her new strategy for taking down the gangs is by suing them in civil court. We have an opportunity to bring these violent street gangs into civil court, out of the shadows, expose them for what they are, and if we're successful, and I think we will be, take their assets and the profit moment for killing our babies. Tomorrow, Mayor Lightfoot is set to introduce an ordinance that will allow the city to sue gangs for the damage that they inflict and seize their assets, the objects of ill-gotten gains. But will criminals who don't respect the law respect the mayor's lawsuit? Will they just be forced to? To discuss, I'm joined by former Chicago police officer Rob Casali and attorney John Mauck, who has successfully defended four people against lawsuits similar to the ones described by Mayor Lightfoot. Gentlemen, thank you for being with me. Um, Rob, let me begin with you. At, you know, on its surface, this sounds great. I mean, as a citizen, as a, a legal journalist, I think, finally, this is terrific. Let's go after these guys. And then I realize, wait a minute, they don't file tax returns. It's pretty hard to figure out where they keep their money. This has got to be really hard to do this. Absolutely. It, it almost seems like a desperate move. Um, why don't we hold them accountable in criminal court where that belongs? It's criminal activity. Um, but again, time and time again in the city of Chicago, um, our leaders, our criminal justice system is failing the average citizen as it's been for so long. You know, releasing criminals after the police officer works hard to get that criminal caught with a, a handgun and that criminal is back out on the street a few hours later. And I don't yeah. know how many countless have committed a crime again after being out on bond for a violent gun 
charge. So, John Malk, you had some success in fighting this kind of uh, lawsuit before, but the rest of us out here in frustration land think, well, what else can we do if we can't get them criminally? And no one's saying that this lawsuit business is going to replace the criminal convictions. It'll be pile on, which is great. Um, but if That's we right. can't get them that way, why not tie them up and make life hell and make them hire a lawyer? You don't get a public defender when you're in civil court. So it's going to screw with you one way or another, right? Uh, not necessarily. You've got, you've got several assumptions there that uh, really allow for police abuse. Uh, make them hire a lawyer. Well, you're, you're assuming they're guilty. Uh, uh, right away, and you can't convict them from a from a criminal point of view. And any of these people who can be tied to a specific crime can always be sued by by the victim. But to have the cities say they can sue gangs, and gangs are not legal entities, and uh, Mayor Lightfoot's going to have to come up with some very novel language in this new ordinance to make gangs liable, because under Illinois law. They're just individuals, and they can sue the individuals now, and they uh, can abuse the young people. What we saw in the lawsuits in the, uh, Elgin and Kane County, uh, where the state's attorney going after all the little fish and getting judgments against them because they couldn't afford a lawyer, uh, default judgments, and saying, look what we're doing. It was, uh, in my opinion, very much a political situation, not a question of really trying to get money, but trying to convince people uh, that, we're, that we're doing something. I, I don't know any place that has succeeded in this civil action, uh, and, and there's been, it's been about 15 years uh, on the books in Illinois, and so a number of communities have tried it. Huh. Uh, hats off to well. Mayor Light can pull it off, but I don't, I don't see it. Well, that just raises so many questions. Um, you know, John Mauck and Rob Casali, thank you for thank your you, input. I know, the, I know the next guy I'm going to ask the same questions to might have some perspective, too. And that's the mayor, uh, or not the, um, not the mayor, the, the former governor of Illinois. Is the mayor's plan a good idea, or is it a political show? You know, uh, Rob Bogoyevich knows a thing or two about politics in Chicago. So he's going to join me next to weigh in on whether this thing is a stunt or whether it actually just might work. That's next. So Mayor Lori Lightfoot in Chicago wants to start suing gang members for their crimes. Great idea on its surface. But will it really work? I'm joined by someone who knows a lot about politics in Chicago, former Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich. Governor, it's good to see you again. Will this idea work or is it all politics? I think it's mostly politics. There's no downside to try to sue a gangbanger who shoots at another gangbanger and then misfires and hits an innocent person. Um, there's all kinds of issues with regard to how you can actually collect the damages if you actually get a conviction in a civil proceeding. I think, frankly, um, she would be better off and the city would be better off if the focus was what it really is. And that is that this is a war that isn't going to be won in the courts. It's going to be won on the streets. And what she ought to do is hire a lot more police officers. I would hire 10,000 police officers, almost double the force. And I would train them with all the best capabilities available. And I'd make them go after those gangbangers, arrest them, disarm them, put them in jail, and then worry about whether or not you want to sue them after that. Can't you walk and chew gum at the same time, though? I mean, I don't know uh, how gangbangers think about the future and finances, but if they start to realize that it's going to cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire lawyers and, you know, litigate these civil cases after they've had to go through the criminal process, don't you think they might think twice about all of this or their leadership might start to wonder if this is worth it? Well, I, I, again, I don't think there's really a downside unless it's taken the focus away from the real fight, which is the one that's going on in the streets. As a practical matter, I don't see too many gangbangers responding to a court order to show up to court. I, I don't see it. I frankly see them laughing at that. The way to get gangbangers, because that's what they are, and they're criminals, and they're violent, and they're shooting up the city of Chicago, particularly in the areas where black people live, the way to stop that is to go get them, arrest them, and put them in jail and disarm them. 
and you need police officers to do it. You can't defund the police. You have to support the police. This mayor long ago lost the police force uh, because she and our governor and some of the other leading Democrats, members of my own party, have decided to declare war on police rather than recognize that for every bad cop, there's 100 good ones. Do you think then that she's doing this to curry favor with the public? Because a lot of people in Chicago were really frustrated. In the segment before you, we were listing off the statistics from Labor Day, and it was just like the apocalypse. I mean, do you think she's saying this because it sounds good, even though maybe a lot of people in the business of crime know it's hard to, you know, take a gang banger to civil court? I think it's mostly a political move. It's cynical. Uh, it's a way to deflect the attention at her failure to keep the people in Chicago safe. Um, I think this is the sort of thing that politicians do all too often. And, uh, you know, she's going to get some press on it, but there's really not a lot of there there. The fact is that summer is almost over. And one good thing about the weather getting colder is gangbangers are less inclined to want to, they're less trigger happy. They shoot at people less in the cold weather. And so the fact that she's done it now suggests it's less about really going after the criminals and more about public relations mm. and preparing for her reelection. It's so weird that that statistic you just said is is actually true. Hey, Rod Blagojevich, good to see you as always. Thank you very much for being with us. Much appreciated. Thank you. Nice to talk to you again. You too. And nice to have you all along with us as well tonight. Thanks so much for being here for this edition of Banfield. Tomorrow night, exclusive uh, interview with one of the former Nexium cult members because guess what? One of the top deputies is being locked up for three and a half years. We'll talk to them tomorrow.